If you remember way back, we left off with the idea of core and skin te uh, temperature, core versus skin temperature. Which one is the prime driver of thermoregulation? Which one is more sensitive? And I showed you that side-by-side -side graph of increases in um, sweat rate or forearm blood flow. And for every change, every small change in core temperature, we saw a big increase in both of those. And that response was modified by a higher skin temperature. So we think that core temperature is paramount. But we've had this question come up before. What do we mean by temperature? Um, uh, what do we mean by core temperature? And what's a critical core temperature? Is it the brain that's critical? Or some composite of the internal organs? Is it torso temperature? Where do we sense it? Where does the brain get that information? Or is there not one place? Is it a number or an average of deep body temperatures? And so since there's no clear-cut answer to that, it's difficult to measure. If we don't know what exactly core temperature is, where do we go to get our measurement? And not only that, but it changes. Consider how blood flow moves through the body. If blood is heated, there's conduction and convection at play. Whichever tissue is most active will generate the most heat. And so core temperature at rest might be different than core temperature during exercise. So it's dynamic. It changes. It's nebulous. We don't know one point where we can measure it. And so how would we go about measuring it? There have been a number of attempts, and we've settled on a few candidates. And the gold standard, unfortunately, is rectal temperature. Unfortunately, I say that uh, for research purposes, not many people want to volunteer for a study where we measure core temperature via a rectal probe. And I'm kicking myself because I meant to bring in some probes to show you, because it's really not a big deal. And I brought them in last week thinking we'd get to this material, but we didn't get to it in time. So I'll bring those in um, on Thursday. They're clean, they're unused, not to worry, but you can see what we're talking about when we uh, mention rectal probes. So commonly we use rectal temperature. You can also use esophageal temperature. And if you think about it, it's just trying to get to the core from two different avenues tympanic temperature in the ear, or intestinal temperature is a really nice new uh, modern technological advancement that uses some less invasive equipment that I'll talk about on the next slide. The rectal temp is the gold standard. That's what we've made all of our uh, heat temperature maps and our formulas use rectal temperature. It's easy to measure. It's cost effective. The probes are $40 to $60 each. They're reusable. Um, and they give good, robust measurements. Now, I'll compare for you a couple different measures of core temperature to highlight the idea that it's dynamic and it changes depending on where you measure it. So these are in the same individual doing two exercise bouts with a rest period in between measuring constant esophageal temperature and rectal temperature. And they're pretty close. At any given point in time, there's not much separating these two lines, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius difference. But you'll notice the responsiveness is fairly different. Esophageal rises quickly with the onset of exercise and drops quickly when exercise stops. Now maybe that's just because the air coming into the body through the trachea has some influence on esophageal temperature. I don't know, maybe it cools it quickly at the end. It doesn't explain why it heats it so quickly. Maybe the esophagus is in close proximity to blood vessels that are um, carrying really hot blood as a result of, of um, the exercise. Maybe it's near the aorta. 
but it's more responsive than rectal temperature. That might not be a good thing. If it's more responsive, are you measuring more accurately, or is there a chance that it responds to errors in temperature as well? If you get to steady state, it doesn't matter. If you're 40 minutes in, you could measure either rectal, uh, rectal or esophageal, and you'd get the same number, 40, 50, 60 minutes in. And that's usually how we like to make these measurements. We don't want to measure core temperature while it's changing. We usually only measure it uh, when it's steady and try to get a sense of heat flow in that steady state. So rectal is a little bit less responsive, but it might be a bit more um, accurate. I actually think it's even more comfortable than an, an esophageal probe. Rectal temperature is... Um, a really small probe that's inserted 10 centimeters, and after you get over that initial awkwardness, you forget that it's even there. You tape it up, feels like you have a tail for a while, but then you're on the bike exercising or running. You don't even realize that it's there. Esophageal, on the other hand, will often go in through the nose, like, um, what's it called in the hospital? You aspirate someone, or you run a I forget what it's called, but you run it in through the nose, down the pharynx, into the esophagus, and you're, you're constantly trying to swallow the whole time. And it just, you can feel this thing sitting in your chest, and it feels like there's no pain, but there's pressure in the middle of your chest, and it's just so distracting. You can't forget that's there. And then the process of removing it is a whole other thing, but disruptive. It's one of my least favorite methods of measuring core temperature. But if given the chance, I wouldn't really call either of these comfortable, they're just more or less uncomfortable. The, the easiest, most user-friendly way to measure core temperature is to use these new uh, telemetry probes that measure intestinal temperature. So these are pills that have a little uh, battery and a thermistor inside. They're completely sealed, and you would swallow those. 12 hours before you exercise, allow it to get through the stomach, work its way through the intestines. So that way, if you take a drink, you're not affecting the temperature. It's sitting right in your guts, so it's measuring core. The longer you wait, the closer it gets to rectal temperature. You don't want to wait too long, obviously. But as long as you're okay with swallowing pills, and this is the size of a, an omega-3 capsule or a standard multivitamin, as long as you're okay with swallowing pills, you have a, um, an iPhone-sized recorder or something that looks like this, and you walk up behind the person, and you just press a button, and it reads temperature, 37.2, 37.3. You can even set it up to collect data every 10 to 15 seconds, and you strap it to the person so it collects it in real time and makes a trace like this. And we use these um, for some of the hockey studies that I did in my uh, doctoral degree. Guys would come over to the bench. You could just take readings right there. You could strap it to them. They could do constant temperature while they were playing. Really versatile. But each of these pills costs 60 to $80. So you need 10 subjects. If you're doing one trial, that's 600 to $800. If you're doing three trials, like you would for control and, and two interventions, you're at $1,800 to $2,400 just for one study, which on a limited budget at a small undergraduate institution like we have now is not really tenable. So much more comfortable, pretty robust. There's good agreement between uh, intestinal temperature and these two, but expensive. Skin temperature, on the other hand, really easy to measure. You have access to the skin always. Sometimes clothing obstructs it, but it's pretty easy to get around that. And you can use the same probes that you would for rectal temperature for skin temperature. They're just long wires that have a little heat-sensitive tip on them. You would tape them in a specific location, 
and you can measure temperature at that location. And skin temperature is really useful because the body isn't only defined by its core temperature. If you measure core, that's not the, the temperature of the person, that's the temperature of their core, and then the gradient as you move towards the skin would allow, to, uh, allow you to calculate whole body temperature. So skin plus core would be mean or average body temperature. And knowing what core temperature is, it's higher at the center of the body, and what skin temperature would be in various locations around the body, you can actually calculate the gradient and therefore figure out um, heat lost through these different pathways. And we're not going to do that. There are complicated equations, but using these two points of data, you can figure out how heat would flow out of the body. You can even figure out where heat would flow out of the body. Much like this temperature back here, the, the dark red areas are where there's more warm blood. If you had sensors in those areas, it would stand to reason that you would lose more heat through those areas than others. The, uh, the theoretical environmental physiologist that wants to model the uh, heat balance during exercise or attempt to determine the, uh, the program or how heat balance is, uh, is set would use this to figure out the input to the thermoregulatory controller. That is, when I'm outside walking my dog late at night and I'm already feeling cold but my body's not cold yet, there's that feed-forward signal from the skin that is providing input to whatever the thermoregulatory controller is in the brain to say you're cooling really quickly. And so you can get a measure of what that imp uh, input would be by measuring skin temperature of the face or the hands, for instance. Now skin is obviously a big organ and so like with core temperature, where do you measure skin temperature? Is it forehead? Is it neck? Is it hand? It used to be 12 sites spread across the body. And there was a pretty good model of skin temperature generated from those 12 sites, and I won't list them all. That got whittled down to four. One at the thigh, one on the forearm, the upper arm, and the chest. And that's not necessarily important. But we were able to predict that skin temperature from those four sites alone. And more recently, we've even been so, uh, we've gotten so good as to say data from one site can give us enough information. If we have uh, thigh temperature, the skin temperature at the thigh, we have pretty good ability to extrapolate whole body skin temperature. So we can use one data point within a small margin of error to approximate the temperature of the entire skin surface using only the thigh. Now obviously, the, the more accurate data that you want, the more points you want, the more um, data points you want to include, but it's pretty good to just use the thigh. And so, in our attempts to try to identify which is most uh, important, we now know how we can measure skin and core. How do we ever divorce the two? How do we separate them? You can measure them all at the same time, but they always tend to change together. Core temperature increases with skin temperature during exercise. Core temperature increases with skin temperature in the heat. So it's really difficult to say if I start to sweat, for instance, it's because of an increase in core temperature. Or if I start to sweat, it's because of an increase in skin temperature. It's hard to say that. And so we use this really unique approach where you can use a heated mattress or um, like a wetsuit that has um, water perfused through um, a network of, of tubes in the, in the surface 
to try to cool the skin independent of the body. So in this example, you have um, an individual lying on a mattress that's heated, and they heat their whole body, and we monitor how the thermoregulatory response changes. And then acutely, while they're still on this hot mattress, you might infuse cold saline, cool to four degrees. And so the blood starts to cool, and you can measure a change at the skin proper, but the core is still hot. There's not enough time, if you measure pretty quickly, for that cold saline to cool core temperature. And so then, if you, if you measure a change in constriction of the arteries, or a change in hormone release, or a change in sweat rate, that's likely due to the acute cooling that you've just imposed on that individual. So heated mattress with cold saline. Or if you have someone exercising and they're wearing one of those water-perfused wetsuits, you can turn the, uh, the cold water pump on so it cools the surface of the skin while they're exercising, and you make the same kind of measurements. And this is, again, one of those uh, tools that the theoretical environmental physiologist would really like to use. It's nice to divorce the two, but never in practice will you observe core temperature go up without skin temperature also going up. During sport, in a desert, both will always increase generally in lockstep with one another. So this is a useful contra uh, construct for studying the influence of these two temperatures independent in the laboratory, but in practice, in a free-living individual, the combined influence will always be present. So it's through this kind of study that we found core temperature is the Batman to skin temperature's Robin. Core temperature is the primary driver of all of these different factors, and skin temperature will modify slightly whatever the response is. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Core temperature is more likely to cause um, complications if it gets too high. The internal organs need to be protected. The skin can vary a bit more. We want to pay attention more to core temperature. So, with that under our belt, let's actually look at what happens to core temperature when we exercise. We'll start with um, passive heat exposure, so just looking at if you are warmed, what happens. Then we'll look at an active heat exposure, what happens if you actively engage in exercise and your body warms appropriately. So as you know, core temperature would go up. How does it go up for me versus any of you in the class? If I were a subject in a study and we were looking at the rate of increase in core temperature and I was doing a couple different exercise workloads, the increase that you would observe would be proportional to work rate. What does that mean? Well, think about the heat balance equation. If you move from sitting at a desk to exercising, the only thing that's really different is you're engaging the muscle. You're increasing metabolism. You're adding heat due to the metabolic effect of exercise. And the more metabolism you, uh, you include or the more heat you add, the greater the increase in heat balance, the more positive it is, and the more core temperature will increase. So core temperature is proportional to work rate in one individual. And that's because there's few other variables. I'm not going to change my fitness. I have the same hormones, the same body composition. If I'm at three different workloads, core temperature changes um, proportionally. But if we want to compare between individuals, there are a lot of differences between any two of you in the class. Body composition, hormone levels, sex is different, fitness is different. Steady state temperature response is different 
because of those extraneous variables. So if um, any two individuals were exercising at the same absolute workload, let's say 100 watts, core temperature would vary largely because of potential differences in fitness. And on the next slide, we'll see how that, um, how that looks. But if you have an individual that is much more fit, 100 watts might not be too stressful, and core temperature wouldn't increase very much. If you have an individual that is less fit, more sedentary, 100 watts might be a lot of work. It might be quite stressful, and so core temperature would increase a lot in those individuals. Same absolute workload, differences in core temperature. But interestingly, if you standardized workload, like you would standardize VO2, a relative workload would yield the same increase in core temperature. If you both exercised at 50% of your aerobic capacity, the increase in core temperature is predictable and similar. This is really interesting because it suggests that our ability to thermoregulate is also something that changes with fitness. Our ability to thermoregulate is something that changes with fitness. We get more efficient at thermoregulating the more fit we become. So what do these look like? That's the next question. You can see that on this slide. On the left-hand side is um, absolute intensity. On the right-hand side is relative intensity. And absolute intensity here is expressed in terms of VO2, which is fine. VO2 and workload almost interchangeable. Pretty close one-to-one -one relationship. This is essentially workload. And then relative intensity on the right-hand side, percent of maximal oxygen uptake percent of your aerobic capacity. And so on the left-hand side, we observe this scattered response. There are similar slopes, so the sensitivity is similar. The rate of increase is similar as you move to higher workloads. But there are just different start points and end points, so that for a given individual with greater or lesser fitness, the response is proportional. The temperature response varies at a given absolute intensity. So just look at 1.5 liters per minute. There's this range of temperature responses where an individual might exhibit 37 degrees all the way up to 38.3. A really wide range of temperature responses. Versus, if you um, prescribe exercise in a relative manner and you have people exercising at a percentage of their aerobic capacity, you remove fitness as a variable, and the temperature response is similar. Everyone starts in the low 37s, and as you progressively increase workload and approach your maximal aerobic exercise intensity. We have the same sensitivity, the same slope, similar increases in temperature in all individuals to uh, a similar critical threshold, a similar, uh, similar critical endpoint. So this is simply the result of differences in fitness and other variables between the individuals. Removing fitness as a variable allows us to standardize that relationship. What's kind of interesting is that if we compare different modes of exercise, here in individuals of the same fitness, so the response should be similar, 
wildly different modes of exercise follow that same trend. Wildly different modes of exercise. Here are arm crank cycling versus leg crank cycling. So the arms have a much smaller muscle mass than the legs. They have a much smaller capacity to do work than the legs. And so if we put an individual at a specific workload, despite these wildly different types of exercise, they exhibit very similar responses in core temperature. There's a smaller muscle mass and a smaller capacity of exercise in the arms than the legs. But if we can fix that workload, core temperature increase is similar. It's a very predictable response. <clears throat> so this is importantly in individuals of a similar fitness. If they were different fitnesses, this would look a lot less clean. And it's still a fair bit scattered now. But yeah, question? When you say fix that workload, you're going to make them similar in comparison to poor muscle mass? Good question. If we fix that workload, so if, um, if we make the metabolic rate equal 625 watts, so we're fixing um, a workload that requires 625 watts of metabolic um, energy, leg cranking and arm cranking produce similar increases in core temperature. Now there's some variation. You can see a difference of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. But overall, the trend is pretty linear. There's a little bit of scatter, but it's a general um, increase around the same trend or the same trend line, the same relationship. Um, fix that workload essentially means pick a point along the x-axis, and then arm cranking and leg cranking result in a similar core temperature at that point on the x-axis, according to this relationship. Good question. So let's see what the direct effects are. We know that core temperature goes up, but why and how? What are the physiological changes that result in that increase in core temperature? There's a lot of really good foundational work done in the uh, Late 60s, early 70s, here summarized by um, Rowell in 1974. He does a great job with his handbook of physiology to lay out all of the changes, and it helps to really um, put them in sequence, I think. So we're going to go through a couple of these classic schematic diagrams. So what we're looking at here is passive heating. This is sitting in a sauna, for instance. Passive heating... 40 degrees Celsius, sitting in a sauna. These are skin versus core temperature. Here, core temperature is blood temperature. So during passive heating, we see that skin temperature leads an increase in core temperature, which makes sense. Heat is being applied from outside the body. The first part of the body that heat runs into is the skin. The skin is warmed, that transfers the heat to the blood, which circulates through the body, warming the internal organs. We're heating from the outside in, and so skin leads an increase in core or an increase in blood temperature over these 70 minutes of passive heating. So we have a heat stress. The body doesn't want to allow this heating to continue, there's this rapid increase that we eventually manage. So what I mean by manage is we enter into a steady state. We, can, we don't see uh, a continued rapid increase in skin temperature. Blood creeps up, but we're able to manage it. How do we manage it? Sitting passively at rest we see a doubling of cardiac output. Flow from the heart. 
cardiac output. The amount of blood pumped liters per minute. We see a doubling of cardiac output from just over 6 liters per minute at rest, eventually to 13 liters per minute by the end of the warming phase. A doubling of cardiac output to supply the skin. All right, we're trying to pump blood to the skin surface, which is where we would lose that heat. It's the only place we can lose heat from the body. You can see the trace of forearm blood flow here, this dashed line. That's approximating the, um, the flow to the skin proper. Cardiac output increases to supply the skin. On the next slide, we'll look at how cardiac output in, uh, increases, but I think you already know the candidates, the, the responses that would result in an increase in Q or an increase in flow. To help with that, we also see a modest decrease in blood flow to what we might call non-essential organs. We're heating passively, we're not exercising, the muscles aren't working, so we can divert some blood flow away from the muscles. We can divert some blood away from the kidneys. We can divert some blood flow away from the digestive system, the intestines, the stomach. That, combined with the increase in cardiac output, means that we have a total of 7.8 liters per minute available at the skin to help cool the body. So 70, oh no, 40 minutes. Sorry, I misread that. It's a total of 70 minutes, but we only begin cooling at 30. So 40 minutes of passive cooling increases core temperature, increases skin temperature, and the response is to divert blood away from non-essential organs, to pump more blood, to supply the skin in the hopes that we can begin to cool the body. We'll see this more when we get to the dehydration section, but one of our primary, well, we've seen it already, one of our primary avenues of heat loss in this situation is through evaporation of sweat. So blood, hot blood at the skin, um, allows evaporation to remove heat from that blood. So this is passive heating. What happens when we exercise? in that situation. <coughs> the direct effects of hyperthermia while exercising are what we're getting into now. So number one, we know blood flow is diverted to the periphery. This has the unfortunate consequence of reducing venous return. Venous return. So blood isn't only pumped out of the heart. The heart needs a supply of blood in order to pump. That supply of blood is compromised because we're trying to send it too many places. It doesn't return to the heart in as large a volume as it should. And so as a consequence, we see that decrease in cardiac output. Oh, no, no, sorry. We didn't see that yet, but we will see a decrease in cardiac output and a decrease in VO2 max. So less venous return essentially means that filling of the heart is compromised. Venous return simply means the return of blood through the veins, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, right? Filling the right atrium. That's the return of blood through the venous system. If that's compromised, what is specifically reduced is end diastolic volume. So remember diastole, the rest period of the heart, the filling period. The heart is passively sitting and trying to fill. And then systole is the active phase. The heart is contracting, generating pressure, pumping blood to the periphery. So you have systolic versus diastolic pressure active versus rest. So end diastolic volume is compromised, meaning stroke volume is lower. 
stroke volume, the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart, if there's less blood in the heart to begin with, and when I say heart, I really mean ventricle, but if there's, if there's less blood in the heart to pump, and diastolic volume is lower, stroke volume is reduced. And if stroke volume is reduced, it's a, a little easier to see now how we, we observe these decreases in cardiac output and VO2 max. This is a fundamental physiological equation. You can calculate VO2 if you know cardiac output and the difference in arterial and venous oxygen. If stroke volume is compromised, this goes down. Cardiac output goes down. Do you remember what the um, what the law of the heart was? The um, the principle describing this phenomenon: if venous return changes, stroke volume changes. One of the fend. Pardon me. Cardiovascular drift. That's actually a good guess. That's not what I'm looking for. That, that will come into play when we get into dehydration. Cardiovascular drift is the increase over time, the exaggerated change in cardiovascular variables. Um, and actually, I can see where, uh, where you're going with this. Yeah, the, the progressive decrease in stroke volume as it drifts down would be cardiovascular drift. It's a result of this phenomenon at the heart though. There is one principle of the heart that describes this cause and effect reaction. If venous return changes, stroke volume changes. Do you remember the principle? Frank Starling. You got it. Yeah. The Frank Starling mechanism. Starling law of the heart. Stroke volume is proportional to venous return. And then if venous return is compromised more and more during exercise, that's where cardi uh, cardiovascular drift comes into play. So both very closely related. The Frank Starling law of the heart. So let's connect those dots. And I think that I changed the uh, order of these slides. If you're looking at them on Moodle, um, I, I feel like it made more sense to put this after the introduction of that first point. Let's explore how um, we get that decrease in cardiac output. So now we're looking at changes due to exercise in the heat. So this is exercising at many different workloads. So this is a range of workloads, again, using uh, VO2 to express the intensity. And then there are two lines on each graph. They are uh, neutral, the closed circles, and then the open triangles are hot. So we're looking at how the response changes from closed circles to open triangles. Well, the first thing that we saw on, the, um, on our first schematic and what we introduced on that last slide is that venous return is compromised. So when we're in the heat, blood is diverted away from the heart. It's, it's at the skin. It's away from non-essential organs. It's elsewhere. And what that means is that less blood is at the heart. Less blood returns to the heart. Venous return is compromised. And so venous return is central blood volume. Those are the same. Central blood volume is a measure of how much blood was returned in the veins. It's the same thing. Since... We're in the heat, and we've sent all of, or a lot of, our um, extra blood to the skin to help cool the body. We see this progressive reduction in venous return at every workload. That's no surprise. That has a direct effect through the Frank Starling law of the heart to reduce stroke volume. If central blood volume is lower, 
there's less blood available to pump. And so at all exercise intensities, stroke volume is reduced. We're not going to take that line down, though. If stroke volume is reduced, there are countermeasures in the body to compensate for that. Remember what those countermeasures, or what one primary countermeasure is? Increased heart rate. Increased heart rate. Right on, Hannah. Stroke volume is compromised. We sense that. And to prevent a fall in pressure, a fall in cardiac output, we try to increase heart rate. Every workload, we see an increased heart rate. And in some cases, that's good enough. That's enough to compensate for the redistribution of blood to the skin. At low workloads, cardiac output is similar in neutral and hot environments. But as we get to moderate and higher workloads, we start to see a separation. We can't increase heart rate enough to maintain cardiac output. The drop in stroke volume is too big. And so we see this compromised cardiac output at higher workloads. And if you went higher than 3 liters per minute, you see an even wider discrepancy. It would get bigger as you uh, approached higher intensities. So all of these are in red because these are warning signals. These are alarm bells. These are all things that are going to help, not help. These are all things that are going to signal the end of exercise. Think about it. These are alarm bells going off. If your heart is racing, are you confident in your ability to perform? Are you likely to set a PB? Probably not. If cardiac output falls, the next immediate um, consequence of that is a reduction in pressure. Cardiac output falls. <coughs> it's like we're closing the valve on blood leaving the heart. There's less blood being input to the arterial system and pressure starts to drop. At all intensities, pressure is lower. Now this is aortic mean pressure, but it should also represent arterial systemic pressure. It should be the same. I always hear the, the words of my old advisor echoing in my head when I think about this. Without pressure, there is no flow. It's because the arteries are pressurized that blood moves in the body. If you lost pressure, blood wouldn't move. So a reduction in pressure is pretty bad. We don't want to see that happen, especially during exercise. Now, not a lot happens in the realms of uh, resistance. This is constriction of the arteries, trying to maintain pressure, or in extraction of oxygen, the AVO2 difference. Not a lot happens in these two values. But all the while, with all of these cardiovascular detriments building, we still see an exaggerated increase in temperature. So everything we've described so far is a response to exercising in the heat. They are countermeasures that the body tries to employ to avoid getting too hot. We're trying to pump blood to the skin. We're compensating for that by increasing heart rate. In some cases, we can't compensate. And despite all of our best efforts, we still get too hot. Despite all our efforts to compensate and send blood to the skin to cool, rectal temperature is higher in the heat. Faster increase, 
higher steady state temperature overall contributing to eventual fatigue. So these are the usual suspects that we're going to come back to and, and reference. When we talk about um, compromised performance or fatigue, when we think about dehydration, we're always going to come back to these types of responses. Accelerated heart rate is one of the, the elements that's always around with fatigue. High temperature, always around with fatigue. Reduced cardiac output, always around with fatigue. Lower blood pressure, always around with fatigue. These are the responses that culminate in premature fatigue. Another way to think about this is shown in this um, plumbing schematic. It's, it's the same principle as what we outlined on the last slide. This is the, the crux of the um, short supply of blood argument. So when uh, we exercise normally, we don't open up this valve to the skin and blood flows in a circuit returning to the heart with no problems. But as we need to divert blood to the skin, it's almost like it pools. We open this valve and blood pools at the bottom of this schematic, which makes it a lot harder to pump up and return to the heart. So this exemplifies the reduction in venous return. As a result, you see the reduction in central blood volume. And because central blood volume is reduced, stroke volume and all those other things are also reduced during exercise. This is the same uh, information that we've just presented, but the analogy here is it's, it's a plumbing analogy, using valves and pipes instead of imagining the vasculature. Blood pools at the bottom of this diagram. Um, let's take a quick break, and there's one other thing that I want to get through, but I want you to digest this first. Uh, there's one other figure that shows some blood distribution um, along th these same lines, but I want to take a minute, think about this, come back to it. We'll recap with this last figure and get through maybe two or three more points before calling it for the day. There's a lot that we've discussed so far. So take a break, relax, let that digest, and we'll, uh, let's say three, four minutes, something like that. Just get up, stretch, walk around, go to the bathroom. <laughs> 